Good afternoon. We are delighted to welcome you to the History of Stevens Traditions webinar. My name is Linda Benninghove and I am the director of the Samuel C. Williams Library at Stevens. We are excited to share with you this webinar by Leah Loskatop, Head of Archives and Special Collections, and Ted Hotaling, Archivist and Digital Projects Librarian. Today's presentation is a collaboration between the Library Archives and Special Collections and the Division of Development and Alumni Engagement. Before we begin, I would like to share a few housekeeping items. The presentation will run approximately 45 minutes in length, followed by a 15 minute Q&A session. Attendees may use the Q&A tool to submit questions. Questions will be collected and posed to our speakers at the end of the lecture. A recording of this webinar will be shared with attendees and those unable to join us. The chat feature is available during this webinar, but questions must be submitted using the Q&A tool. For Zoom support, please send an email to zoom at stevens.edu. And with that, I will introduce Leah Laskatoff and Ted Hotaling. Thanks, Linda, and uh, hello, everyone. My name is Ted Hotaling, and I am the Archivist and Digital Projects Librarian here at the library. Uh, and thanks for coming out today. Uh, I know this topic has been of interest to a lot of you, so uh, I hope that we can show you some lesser known aspects of Stephen's history that go back to its very beginnings. Um, so even if you're, if you're a little familiar with some of these traditions, uh, I'm hoping to shine a light uh, on their origins and show you some really great imagery taken from the library's archives and special collections. Uh, so my portion of the lecture is going to focus on Stevens's first 50 years or so. And in doing the research for the lecture, I was really surprised at the, the sheer number and diversity of activities at a time when there were really only about a couple of dozen to uh, a couple of hundred students on campus. And it's fascinating to see that, like most student traditions at universities, in 19th century America, their origins came not from the administration or the faculty, uh, but from the students themselves, who even when the school was barely 20 years old, recognized that a school of higher education had to be more than just brick and mortar and classroom instruction. And as important as it is to receive an education, college is also about community, uh, a sense of belonging, identity, and continuity that ties together generations of students and alumni who are bound together by these types of shared experiences. Uh, so that idea lies at the heart of these traditions. And I'll just note that uh, I'm not gonna get into Greek life, athletics, or other aspects of student life from this time period. We'll just, we'll just have to save that for another lecture. Um, so my portion is gonna focus on about four bygone traditions. Uh, the calculus cremation, the cane rush, or cane spree as it was later known, the flag rush, and cage ball. So we'll start with one of the earliest traditions at Stevens, the, the calculus cremation, uh, which was one of the more colorful events that was held annually at the end of the spring semester. Oops. And it was started by a group of sophomores in the class of 1890, who apparently, <laughs> apparently really took a dislike to this particular branch of mathematics. So it was first held on June 8th, 1888, to mark the conclusion of this reviled course that was required of all Stevens second years. And while there's little photographic documentation from the earlier calculus cremations, we do have some of the announcements for the event, which are pretty interesting on their own. So in the weeks leading up to the event, uh, you would see all of these eye-catching proclamations posted around campus, written in this kind of purple prose text announcing the capture of calculus at the hands of the heroic sophomore class, along with the list of its many crimes committed against the student body. And as you can see here, the language is just filled with fire and brimstone and passion and some pretty good mathematical puns too. Uh, and we're pretty fortunate to have some of these in, in the archives because many of them were printed on newsprint or Bristol board, which uh, usually are pretty ephemeral and subject to decay. And the uh, proclamation on the right in particular was pretty brittle and fragile. So we had to 
rehouse it and it's uh, safely stored away in, in our collections facilities. So on the night of the trial, uh, which was usually held after commencement, the sophomore class would don these fantastical costumes and with much pomp and ceremony, they would carry an effigy of calculus to the nearby Elysian fields where the accused was uh, placed on a wooden pyre to stand trial for his offenses. And later the pageant would be held on campus after the construction of the athletic field in 1907. Uh, some years, the role of calculus was played either by a student or a faculty member, as you can see from this photo from the 1920s. You can kind of see a little uh, devil character in, uh, in the middle left. And the, the trial portion was held in front of a, a, a rapt audience of students, faculty, and curious onlookers who shouted and jeered from the grandstands as the student prosecutors argued their case before a jury of their peers. Um, and one account from 1908 said that there was a crowd of about a couple hundred people, which is pretty incredible for you know, a time when there really weren't too, wasn't much of a, a population at, at, at Stevens. And what's great about the trial part is the, the faculty got to participate too. So professors from the Department of Mathematics would uh, come to the defense of calculus. Um, but they never really received much sympathy from the students, like no matter how well they pleaded their case. Uh, as was tradition, calculus would be found guilty and his effigy, quote, consigned to oblivion. And uh, this weekly film reel reproduced in the link uh, provides a really great overview of the, the whole pageant with the, the trial, the costumes, the parade, and then the, the bonfire afterwards. And um, when, when I saw this, uh, actually I, I reached out to the, the Library of Congress who has a lot of these early film segments preserved in, in their archives. Uh, but sadly, the, they don't have a record of this feature uh, on Stevens, but still hopeful that it might turn up in someone's attic someday. So you never really know when it comes to these, these old historic collections. And uh, I found a pretty good, eyewitness account from uh, the 1911 issue of the Stevens Indicator. Uh, so I'll, I'll quote a, a brief expert, excerpt here. Quote, upon hearing the results of the trial, the sophomores under whose auspices the affair was held formed a furious mob and descended upon the arch fiend of mathematics with little opposition from the officers of the law and proceeded with the customary snake dance around Hoboken finally consigning the effigy to oblivion through the medium of a huge bonfire at the center of town, end quote. So the, the snake dance seen here in, in this photo was, uh, was essentially a huge conga line uh, of students and was practiced at uh, every opportunity, it seems, for, for pep rallies, for football victories against rival schools, and even one that celebrated the opening of the Morton Lab uh, building back in 1906. It's just a thing that you uh, did at Stevens back in the day. Uh, but the, the calculus cremation wasn't just a colorful pageant. It, it brought together the entire school and allowed everyone, faculty, staff, students, uh, to blow off some much needed steam at the end of a long and grueling semester. And for the sophomores, it also acted as a transition into the ranks of upperclassmen. Now they were juniors. Uh, which brought them status and esteem on campus. But I should note that uh, like many of these early traditions at Stevens, uh, they were not entirely unique. By the time that we started our own calculus cremation in 1888, it was being practiced by quite a few schools in the Northeast. Uh, Yale, Columbia, Amherst, Dartmouth, Lehigh, and, and RPI, just to, to name a few. And at Syracuse University, for example, the Tradition went through uh, a number of transformations. In its first incarnation in 1873, they did a, a burial of calculus ceremony. And in the years that followed, calculus was either cremated, la launched into the air by balloon, or drowned in a nearby lake. But by 1918, the, the calculus cremation, along with many of the other extracurricular activities on campus, were temporarily suspended after the uh, Navy Steam Engineering School was established at Stevens 
during World War I to uh, train naval ensigns for, uh, for the war effort. And in the 1920s, the tradition came back and enjoyed a few decades of popularity until it was put on hold again uh, during World War II. And as things slowly got back to normal on campus uh, after the war, uh, the calculus cremation was again revived in 1949 uh, for that year's Alumni Day. And for the next decade or so, the cremation remained uh, a wildly popular part of the annual spring sports weekend that was held every May. And it lasted into about the 1960s, but a lack of participation and dwindling enthusiasm amongst the student body led to it slowly being phased out and it ended up being replaced with other uh, end of the semester activities. Uh, so now we're gonna move on to the interclass rushes. And rivalry between the freshman and sophomore classes was a source for, for many of the earlier traditions here at Stevens. Uh, most notably the annual interclass rush games, which were held near the beginning of the school year uh, every fall. And essentially they were a series of field games and served uh, as a proving ground where students could test their mettle and vie for, for bragging rights in the eyes of their peers. And the sheer intensity of these games also promoted class unity, particularly for the incoming freshman class who barely knew each other in the first few weeks of school. So everyone kind of, by no choice of their own, had to come together and work as a team in order to defeat the more seasoned sophomores. So during these first few months, uh, your time as a Stevens freshman would have been fraught with trial, both inside and outside the classroom. So we'll start with the, the earliest game, the, the cane rush. And the origins of the cane rush can be found in probably the, the first decade of Stevens' existence, where you would see these impromptu scraps between the freshman and sophomore class flaring up every now and, and again on campus. Uh, back then, the, the sophomores would literally sneak up on and, <laughs> and beat up the unsuspecting freshmen with canes. It was just horrible. But in 1889, a group of students voted to officially ban these violent rushes and instead start a formal competition between the two classes that would be held each year to decide who was the stronger group of students. And the cane rush, as it was called, would have had a, a set date and a codified set of rules with an accompanying uh, point system. And these are the earliest, earliest photos that we have of the cane rush, which were published in the 1891 volume of the eccentric yearbook, which is the predecessor for the link. Uh, and as stated in the rules, one representative from each class would stand in the middle of the field, uh, each one gripping a, a single wooden cane. Uh, so members of the freshman and sophomore classes would line up on opposite ends of the field. And at the start of the gun, the two classes would rush towards the center and attempt to wrench control of the cane from the opposing class. And so points were awarded according to the number of hands and and fingers that you would have attached to the cane afterwards. And the neat thing is that the winners of the cane rush were awarded with these ceremonial clay pipes and were given smoking privileges on campus, which afforded status for, for uh, some of the younger students. But uh, as you can probably imagine, uh, the competition, which often numbered uh, anywhere between 40 and 50 students on each side could, get, uh, could quickly get out of hand. And, in 1892, citing numerous injuries to students, the College Senate, an early version of student self-governance, voted to follow Princeton's lead and change the cane rush to a cane spree. And that meant stricter rules and smaller groups of students, uh, smaller matches determined by, by weight class. A student editorial in the Stoot uh, commended the actions of the Senate, stating that they, quote, supported this action on the grounds that it is an inevitable and eminently wise step in the direction of humanity and progress. And that while the cane rush is undoubtedly fun to watch, it is in fact brutal and dangerous and is becoming more dangerous yearly with the increasing size of the classes, end quote. Uh, but according to our records, these new rules were followed some years and ignored on others. 
So some years he would have a cane rush and other years he was a cane spree. Uh, but the cane spree along with the tug of war and the cage ball competitions, which I'll get into later, uh, lasted for quite a while at Stevens. Um, I don't have an exact date, but our records show that it was practiced well into uh, the 1980s with separate matches held for uh, men and women, as you can see uh, in this photo from, from 1982. All right, so now we come to the flag rush. And around, around the turn of the 20th century, there really wasn't much space on campus for athletics and, and other large scale activities. Many of the early Stevens sports teams had to lug their gear to the nearby Elysian fields or the St. George cricket grounds kind of in northern Hoboken. Uh, but that all changed in 1907 when Castle Point Field was built on the present day location of the Devon Athletic Field. And as a result, on campus athletics drastically expanded, especially for interclass competitions. So, in addition to the cane spree and tug of war matches, there were now track meets, intramural football and lacrosse matches, and a new game that was starting to gain popularity in the Northeast, the flag rush. And the first regulated flag rush at Stevens was held on October 16th, 1907. And it was inspired by Columbia University who had started the tradition the previous year at, at, at their school. And we're lucky that a member of the Stevens Photographic Club was on hand to take photos of this first match which were uh, printed in the stoot that year along with uh, an account. And uh, if you're curious, the sophomores won, uh, which they usually did for, <laughs> for whatever reason. But, but how is it played? Uh, the way the flag rush worked is the sophomore class was responsible for defending the flag, which was placed on a 10 foot pole in the middle of the athletic field. And the students would form a human shield around it. And the freshmen would gather at the opposite end of the field and upon the signal would rush in this mad dash, rush towards the sophomore phalanx in an attempt to climb atop the pole and capture the flag. If the sophomores retained possession after 10 minutes, they won the match. And usually there were about two or three matches uh, held that day. And here's a, a scene of uh, how it usually played out. Pretty violent. <laughs> Oftentimes, whichever class had the bigger turnout ended up winning. And broken bones and trips to the infirmary afterwards were obviously uh, pretty, pretty common. And here's what the scene looked like afterwards. Uh, after each match, the, the whole field would be covered in pieces of ripped up trousers, shirts, and underwear strewn all over the place. And uh, in doing the research, it was pretty cool to read like all the play-by-play the -play accounts in the stoop, uh, along with these uh, strongly worded letters from members of the two classes and the, each one's accusing the other of cheating and hiring ringers from the junior and senior classes to uh, tip the scales in, in their favor. Uh, so the last competition I'll talk about today is the cage ball game, uh, which was first played at Stevens in 1919. And cage ball was the last addition to the original interclass matches uh, from these early days of uh, Stevens history. And the rules for the new game were printed in the October 1919 uh, issue of the Stute. And what happened is the freshman and sophomore classes would each try to push or pass or punch this large inflated ball down the athletic field and through the opposing team's goalposts, uh, all the while not allowing the, the ball to touch the ground. And as was the case with uh, the other early rushes, incidents of students being trampled underfoot in this bad uh, stampede was, was a pretty common hazard. And as you can see here, uh, cage ball later became uh, a co-ed activity in the 1970s uh, into the 1980s as part of the, the field games that marked the beginning of uh, the school year in the fall. And I wager that maybe some of you in, in the audience today probably uh, participated in this game. So I'd be kind of curious to hear your experiences in the, the Q&A uh, section afterwards. Uh, but as with uh, most student traditions at, at universities, there are uh, ebbs and flows to their popularity. Gradually, the 
calculus cremation and the interclass rushes just simply faded into obscurity. Um, but although many of the traditions covered in this lecture are no longer practiced at Stevens, uh, uh, I do want to mention that in, in the last few years, the, the Office of Student Affairs and these new student leaders have been doing a, a really great job in starting some new traditions uh, for the 21st century, uh, like the Whitpen Walk, the, the duck dance, duck days, just to name a few. So traditions uh, here at Stevens are definitely not dead. They've just taken on a different form, but they, they still serve the same purpose uh, of allowing students to come together and feel a part of something larger than themselves. And I like this, this sentiment uh, in the editorial from the student. I'm not gonna quote it in full, but I think it kind of sums up the, the wistfulness of a lot of this passing of time and the ebbs and flows. Uh, and in conclusion, uh, we just hope that when the library does a lecture like this in the future, uh, long after we retire, uh, we hope that we have uh, new images, new stories to draw upon that tell what the next 150 years are, are, are going to be like. And we hope, we hope uh, that they'll be preserved here in the archives, uh, like the records you've seen today. So uh, thanks everyone for listening. And uh, now I'll hand it over to Leah, who's going to talk about student hazing, senior pranks, and some other interesting traditions. So take it away, Leah. Yeah, thank you so much, Ted. That was great. Um, so yeah, I'll be talking about freshman hazing and customs, and then also um, the former tradition of the annual senior trip and St some Stevens pranks. So next slide, please. Freshman customs um, for first year students was a very common practice at Stevens and other universities and colleges, and it really served two purposes, to acquaint the incoming freshmen with the customs and traditions of Stevens and to unite the freshman class and also to promote school spirit. Next slide. The freshman handbook, um, although these customs and traditions were prevalent before the first handbook was published in 1908. It was more formalized at that point. And that first handbook was actually published by the Stute newspaper staff. And the handbook was required by all freshmen. Um, they would usually have it in their back pocket and keep it with them at all times. And it was their responsibility to learn all of the requirements and customs um, for a first year student. These customs um, changed over the years. This sample that I have here is from 1962. Um, requiring the class dink, which was the hat, was a custom that was around for a very long time. Um, and then other things would shift, such as having your name card, um, where you could, um, the sophomores, you know, could easily see their name because the sophomores were the ones that were meant to um, keep the freshmen in check, as Ted had mentioned, and make sure that the freshmen were um, doing all of their responsibilities and following the rules. Um, so I'll have, I have a few examples on the next slide um, of some of the rules over the years. And I've, I wanted to read off a list of some of the earlier rules from um, an early handbook from 1924. So again, um, all freshmen were required to wear the dink uh, while they were in Hoboken. Um, freshmen would, should obtain the dink immediately. Um, that was a requirement for entering. And also um, take part in all the interclass rushes and games unless physically unable to. They were meant to rise when the alma mater was sung or when the president entered the auditorium. Um, they were meant to salute all members of the faculty, carry the bags of visiting sports teams at the request of the managers, know all the college yells and songs by October 7th, and also help decorate the grounds for alumni day. Wear black socks at all times while in Hoboken, 
Um, the sock sometimes was changed to wear one black and one white sock. So that kind of varied over the years. Um, freshmen were meant to use only the side entrance of the administration building, also known as the A building and now, um, now known as Edwin A. Stevens Hall or EAS. So again, sophomores were required to keep a constant check on the freshmen in order to be sure that they were fulfilling their responsibilities. Um, a sophomore was entitled to question any freshman at any time between the hours of 8 a.m. and 6 p.m. while on campus. And the freshman was required to answer any questions asked of them. And these are just a few samples on screen here of uh, some previous handbooks. I really like the 1964 one because that's when the World's Fair happened in Queens, New York. Next slide, please. So hazing, um, the controlled hazing, which occurred for about three days, was tied in with the interclass rushes and the games that occurred. And um, as Ted mentioned, like during the war years, uh, the customs and hazing in general was completely eliminated. And also, um, vet veterans were not uh, were were um, immediately. Um, omitted from any kind of hazing in the class, uh, the, the incoming freshman class of 1945, if you look at that freshman handbook, they omitted all of these customs and rules because almost that entire class at Stevens were all war, 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 um, war veterans. And so they omitted that completely during that time. Um, the controlled hazing again would last about three days at the beginning of the fall semester. Um, this controlled hazing would included, um, you know, the sophomores basically painting the freshmen, um, using shaving cream on them. I have I have a quote from the 1960 Stute article describing a uh, freshman hazing event. During the three days of freshman customs, it is estimated that four pounds of shaving cream, 600 lipsticks, and 16 ounces of shoe polish were worn by freshmen. They were asked such questions as, what is the school mascot? Duck. What is the favorite expression on campus? In your ear. And what is the number of bricks in the Navy building? Um, 642,000. So they were required to know the answers to a lot of these questions um, and they would be randomly asked them during this process. Um, although they would have the controlled hazing only during the interclass rushes and games, the freshmen were required to adhere to the rules and guidelines of the customs laid out in the handbook for the entire academic year. So once they were able to you know, move on to the next level, they didn't have to abide by those rules. Next slide. So um, in the 1969 freshman handbook, um, the incoming freshman on, in that year, um, the dink was no longer required. Um, instead, um, a t-shirt with your class number was handed out to the incoming freshman. And that became a new tradition that lasted for at least up until the 80s. And then, um, you know, a lot of these traditions changed with as the campus began to grow, became co-educational in 1971. Um, and also, you know, just um, with that growth and change, new traditions developed. Um, also, as Ted mentioned earlier, like our tradition now, whip and walk with the graduating seniors and also the duck dance. The freshman handbook um, had these some of these customs listed up until maybe the 1990s. I noticed in the 1990s they started instead of handing out the the T-shirt with the class number, they would um, hand out a Stevens banner to the incoming freshmen. So that became a different tradition that developed over the years. All right, next slide. So senior trips. Senior trips was um, an annual tradition for Stevens students for many years. The first account of an annual inspection trip happened in 1914. Um, 
the, these trips would include the entire senior class, um, which in the early years was maybe only 20, sometimes 30 students. Um, and then later on, you know, actually you obviously grew to a lot, a lot larger numbers. Um, these trips would um, be, the students would go to major industrial centers, um, as far as Akron, Ohio, where Goodyear is located, they would um, visit companies such as General Electric Company, Western Electric Company, Bethlehem Steel. It was a good bonding experience for the seniors. Um, Stevens was very much a commuter school in the early days. There was um, no residence halls on campus until we purchased the Castle Stevens in 1910, and it became a residence hall that housed only 44 men in 1911. And then the only other dedicated, the next dedicated residence halls were Jacobus and Palmer in 1937. So this was a chance for the students to get together and kind of have a bonding experience and kind of a last hurrah so to speak, before they graduate and leave Stevens. It also enabled this, the seniors to actually see the theory that they were studying at Stevens and put it into practice and see how it was put into practice. And it just gave them the opportunity to travel. All right, next slide. So a senior trip would usually start early in the morning on a Monday. Um, you would meet at um, some ungodly hour, um, like 6 a.m. at Penn Station <laughs> and take a train to either Bethlehem, Pennsylvania or maybe Buffalo, New York. Um, some of the companies that they vis visited, um, let me see, I have a list here. Bethlehem Steel, Worthington Pump and Machinery Corp, B of Goodrich, General Electric, Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company, which is in Akron, Ohio, and then Carnegie Steel and Heinz in Pittsburgh, and also Niagara Falls Power Company. So they would go up to Niagara Falls as well sometimes. Um, the students would meet at Penn Station, board the train, and um, take off for a week. They would have um, a, a variety of stops during that week. They would usually return home on a Saturday. And it wasn't, again, like it wasn't, it was, it was not only an educational experience, it definitely was a bonding experience for them as well. And definitely a lot of hijinks happened during the senior trip. Next slide. So here are a few photos. Um, one is from a past senior trip, inspecting the George Washington Bridge in 1960. And then also, um, I mentioned Goodyear was a, a stop during the, 19s and the 1920s and 1930s. And so um, there's a great photo of um, the Goodyear headquarters in Akron, Ohio. Next slide. Link um, staff would always write about their class history and um, in the early days and usually include the senior trip in that description. So I have a little excerpt from the 1936 senior trip. Scheduled to leave at 11, our train finally left Buffalo some 20 minutes late. Between a group who had visited a dance hall and couldn't find a taxi and Ducky Wucky who went to the wrong station, Professor Fazandi contracted another headache. The ride from Buffalo to Pittsburgh was uneventful outside of a few minor feuds. Pittsburgh proved dismal. At this stage, we were all rather tired and smoke and rain didn't enhance what beauty the city of Bridges has. The Carnegie Steel Corporation and the Heinz Company were inspected. Doubtedly, the Heinz employees will remember the class of 36 as a group of cowboys packing water pistols. So there's always kind of like a funny story or description of the senior trips usually in the yearbook and that one kind of caught my eye. All right, next slide. All right, so the last senior trip. Um, the last senior trip is also tied in with one of the most infamous Stevens pranks, which I'll talk about next. Um, the class of 1969 were, were the last class at Stevens to have a senior trip. 
Um, and you can see from the Stute headline, they were kind of questioning the value. Um, I think it ended up becoming, well, for one thing, this, the, the number, the class numbers were getting too large. Um, also, Stevens was prepping to become a co-educational campus. Um, and, and then also, the senior trips were very much tied in with pranks on campus. It became a tradition to pull some kind of hijinks the night before a senior trip. So, and that happened many, many times. And there was um, one time in particular with um, members of the class of 69 that kind of stood out. And so I don't know if that's a reason why senior trips stopped, but um, it probably didn't help. <laughs> Next slide. So student pranks. Um, these two iconic objects on campus um, have been the targets for many of many hijinks on campus by students. Um, <laughs> the Torchbearer statue, which has been um, in front of the Samuel C. Williams Library since 1964, um, has been the subject to many um, paintings and um, other um, malfunctions that have gone on <laughs> over the years, and also the Stevens Cannon, which is, has been on Castle Point since 1888. Next slide. So the cannon. Um, that, that one headline really cracked me up. Revolutionary War Cannon has absolutely no history. I'm like, <laughs> it, sounds, it kind of reads like an Onion headline or something. It definitely does have history. It was uncovered by the Stevens family in 1888. Um, they owned the property, which is now Elysian Park, and there was a hotel there named the Colonnade Hotel. They were doing some ex excavation and making and turning it into a park, and they uncovered this cannon um, that is a Revolutionary War cannon and it was French made. It has been on Castle Point since 1888. So um, the prank that occurred with um, the class of 69 members was stealing the tech cannon, um, you know, twice in basically one semester. And I have a great oral history with um, Ed Eichhorn and Jerry Crispin, who were the culprits. Um, and they I'm not going to play the clip, which is in the next slide of the oral history, but I would highly recommend you checking out that project page and listening to it yourself because the way that they describe it is um, pretty entertaining. And it really kind of goes through the, all the details of them stealing the cannon. The first time they stole it was the night before a senior trip, even though I don't think they were seen, you know, seniors at the time, but they were doing it for the senior trip that was going on and they stole the cannon and they um, push it down Washington Street to the Erie Lackawanna. And then and they got, I th believe they got picked up by some Hoboken cops that caught them. Um, and then the second time was when they stole the cannon and they managed to get the cannon on a ferry to Manhattan. And they placed the cannon in front of City Hall there. So um, it's pretty entertaining. And that they happened to be in the class that had the last senior trip. Um, so next slide. Um, this is the project page for um, the voices from Castle Point. If you were always looking for more oral history interviews, so if you would like to share your story and your memories with us, um, that's really what makes Stevens history is documenting your experience at Stevens and your memories. So just reach out to me and let me know if you're interested. And I highly recommend listening to this clip. Um, they were interviewed by Olivia Schreiber, class of 2018, who did an amazing job um, and was a great interviewer. So thank you for that. Next slide. So torchbearers. Um, after the torchbearers arrived in 1964, um, probably around in the 1970s, it became an annual tradition for the freshmen to damage the torchbearer statue. That normally um, meant painting it and 
you know, putting things on it. Um, in 19, actually, funny story, in 1971, the first class of women, they um, conducted their own prank, which they, um, they did a panty raid on the men on campus, and they actually placed their underwear around the statue. Uh, but this article here is from the 1991, and Dean Everson at the time was getting very upset about all the damage that was going on with the Torchbearer statue, and uh, eventually, that tradition thankfully died because the, every time the statue was painted or damaged, they would have to clean the statue. And it's a beautiful piece of artwork and it actually was um, getting some serious damage that was happening along with it. And so around the 1990s, the, um, that tradition ended of painting the Torchbearer statue um, annually with incoming freshmen. All right, next slide. So this is my last slide. Um, thank you so much for joining us. I wanted to, you know, as part of the freshman custom, customs, you had to learn um, the alma mater and some of these other songs like the Old Stone Mill, which refers to um, the main administration building, also known as EAS. And so if you know the words to this song, please feel free to sing along at home. Um, this is a little recording of Robert Wolf, who's probably about 90 years old right now, and he, still remembers all the words to the song. So it's kind of amazing. I have an oral history clip with him um, on our project page as well, which is a um, pretty amazing story. So listen to Robert Wolf seeing the old stone mill and please join along at home if you wish to. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> this, this was a song that must have been sung by my father's family and our family. And it was a, a sports song, it was a fight song. Okay. And it sort of went like this. There's a college of engineering that is known as the old stone mill. Every part of it is dear to a Stevens engineer from the shops to the castle on the hill. And when friends they gather, you can bet your heart they'll say the engineers, the engineers are in the lead again today. Stevens, we're true to you and to the old red and gray. Stevens, we're going to raise your colors high today. I'm a rambling wreck from Stevens Tech and a heck of an engineer. You can hear the old song still, and it means we're going to fight, fight, fight for the old stone mill. Thanks again. I um, believe we have a question and answer period. So I'll move it over to Linda. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Leah. Thank you. Um, we welcome you to share any questions you may have using the Q&A tool. We already have some questions which we're excited to answer. Questions will be collected and posed to our speakers at this time. And of course, you have our contact information for Leah and Ted. And we will go ahead and get started with our Q&A. Okay. So the first question we have is for Leah. This is from Olivia. What is meant by controlled hazing? Was there uncontrolled hazing too? Um, controlled hazing was the administration was fully aware of what was going on. It wasn't anything that was dangerous. They were very much against anything that would harm anyone. So it was considered controlled hazing, if that makes sense, as opposed to um, the students going off script and doing their own things like there was supervision involved so all right great thank you um the next question we have is submitted by peter astor class of 1964. at some point sophomores would kidnap a freshman and deposit him someplace without money he had to find his way home <laughs> friend gary simroth and I hope I'm pronouncing that properly, uh, class of 1965 was one such kidnappee. 
his story told today is both frightening and enormously funny. What do we know about that? Um, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't know. I, I, there's some records of like, mainly from the stoots and stuff like that, where they have mentioned the kidnapping, but usually it doesn't get into that much detail. Um, but we know that that occurred. And, um, you know, there was other things too, where Stevens, um, this is a different thing, but I, I only recently learned about like Stevens even going to MIT and painting Stevens all over MIT <laughs> and doing stuff like that. Um, but that's why we need oral histories too, because I need those personal accounts from alumni where there's not everything is documented in the archives. We only have, um, you know, and we're going off this presentation of what we actually have documented in the archives. There's so much more. There's so much more that alumni know that we don't know. So, but Ted, do you want to add to that? I mean, I, I've, I've read accounts of that in, in the Stute. So I, I, I can't recall what, what year the gentleman said, 1964, I think. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to have to look that up because uh, yeah. Yeah, there, there's every year there's, there's an account of those kidnappings and they're, and they're hilarious to, to, to read. So I'll have to check that out. Yeah, we'll look it up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and and if you want the that particular uh, issue of the student or, or that or that article, I mean, we'd be happy to send it to you if you get in touch yeah. with one of us. Great, thank you both. Um, the next question we have is, what is the origin of the name Elysian? Several locations have that name. So, what is the origin? Do we know anything about the origins of the name Elysian? Uh, I personally don't know. I think it's like a Greek mythology reference. But uh, interestingly enough, like supposedly the first modern game of baseball was played in the Elysian Fields here in Hoboken in, in 1846, uh, allegedly. That's that's what the sign says, at least. But um, that, that that would be a good question for the Hoboken Historical Museum. They they're they're kind of our colleagues, but they deal with kind of general. Um, Hoboken history, and I'm, I'm sure if somebody there has a more uh, thorough answer for, for you. That's right. Their executive director, Bob Foster, I'm sure would be happy to address that question, and we can even reach out as well. Yeah, he would definitely know. Yeah, yeah. for sure. Um, we have another question. Do you have any information on the Golden Ream Award? R-E-E-M. Golden Ream. What year was that around? I, I don't know offhand, actually, but that's something um, I can follow up on. If, the, if um, that person wanted to leave an email, we would um, email them back and see if we can dig up that information. Um, okay. We're just slowly getting back into the physical archives, so some of these questions might be better. Um, we might need access to the physical archives to like answer them, but we are getting to that place now, so that's a good thing, you know? Great. Yeah, I'm kind of curious what what that is because I mean there were a lot of like uh, honorary societies on campus that kind of bestowed like their own awards and then there was also like uh, awarding of athletic insignia like if you made it to the varsity team and stuff like that but uh, Golden Ream no I haven't heard of that. Okay I haven't either I'll, we'll look it up <laughs> these are great questions. <laughs> great great. Stump, stump um, the archivist. Yeah I love it. <laughs> Right. Um, I will mention a couple of comments that came in through this as well. Um, it sounds like uh, some students did other things to the torchbearer statue, including um, putting a pumpkin on its head. Oh. Um, and also, uh, one person mentioned that uh, one prank hi fi um, that they were involved in was stowing aboard the SS Stevens when it was moved from Bethlehem Steel to the pier. So. S.S. Stevens stories are great. That, that's, that's more uh, Leah's expertise. I, I think we're going to have to do a part two for this lecture, actually, because like, right. um, yeah, <laughs> for sure. Yeah. Um, we do have one question. Uh, would, would we like to hear about current traditions? So I think um, if I'm interpreting the question correctly, it sounds like uh, perhaps this person would like to share about current yeah. Stevens student traditions. I, I think that's a I think that's a great idea. Um, I, I, I do think that it's kind of important to take the time to acknowledge why this particular period that we talked about is so well covered in in the current mm -hmm. archives is because our, our first two librarians, uh, they're 
there, Enid May Hawkins was the first librarian at Stevens and she was hired in 1906 and her successor, Frances Duck, so, which some of you may have, have, have known uh, Mrs. Duck, she succeeded uh, Enid Hawkins in 1946 and they were really, really gung ho about like reaching out to current student organizations, uh, faculty, staff, gathering everything that they can about Stevens ephemera. Uh, Enid Hawkins even created like a, a collection called the Stevensania collection. And there was a room in the old Lee building that was devoted just for the display of uh, pennants and uh, the, a complete collection of the yearbooks and literary magazines published by Stevens students and all that. So uh, the first, I would say like 50, 75 years, maybe 100 years is it's pretty well covered in the collections. But I mean, as, as Leah kind of uh, pointed out. I mean, there is a bit of a gap in kind of the ensuing mm -hmm. decades, and that's the result of that no one really did the work to to reach out and not just collect it, but to preserve it. Because like, if you collect something and stick it in a shelf, it's probably not going to do too well, like in 20, 30, 50 years. So, I mean, we, we, we want to do a better job of collecting the Stevens history in the present. So uh, hopefully that can be uh, a collaboration between me and Leah and uh, everyone here in the audience. Great, and that actually leads into another question which is very similar. Is the library accepting donations of artifacts of Stephen's traditions? And so I think you've answered that. We in are. That. Wonderful. They should Wonderful. email us if they have donations that they're interested in um, asking about. Yeah, great. Um, one person wanted to know how many folks were tuned in today and at least 53 there may have been a couple of more that but I at least 53 um, and we can get that exact number um, to you as well um, let's see there's a couple of great comments as well um, one question is how are you archiving current traditions that might be captured digitally uh, social media as prime example um, we're, we're doing the best we can. Uh, I, I've, I've been using a tool called uh, Instagram Scraper, which kind of um, collects the embedded images and audio files and video files in Stevens Instagram accounts. And this is just like the official Stevens things. Like we're, there, there, there's privacy concerns. Like if we just suddenly start um, ripping content from student accounts and things like that. So like we, we, we want to kind of like, have it be a, a, a collaboration. Like if, a, if we reach out to a student group or if they reach out to us, like we kind of want to ensure that like that uh, their confidentiality would be kind of taken into account, things like that. But the question about like collecting digital information, uh, that's, that's, a, that's a hot button topic in the world of archiving because, you know, even the, the Library of Congress and the National Archives, like every year, like they hold these conferences uh, giving new best practices about how to archive email or mp3s and things like that and they're constantly being updated but digital information is like incredibly ephemeral and, and hard to capture like in its original form with all the accompanying metadata that provides the context for it um, so we we're, we're working on a, a on a digital preservation plan but uh, mm -hmm. It's a lot of work, <laughs> so that's yeah. that's a long that's a long term project. But we 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 definitely do uh, uh, collect digital files because I mean that's just the way most students these days produce content or express themselves. That's great. That's something we talk about a lot on the library staff for sure. <laughs> Endless yeah. conversations about <laughs> preservation and digital preservation. Um, we have a couple of. Excellent additional questions um, and some great comments. This is really wonderful. Um, one person has shared that the golden ream was awarded to the senior with the lowest GPA who made it <laughs> out the door as last in class. And one person has shared that um, the award was given to a faculty member who was the most strict that reamed the students out as as much okay that's great oh, that's, that's, great. that's, that's, what that's to. great okay that's wonderful yes given to a faculty member who was the most strict great okay good so um there's a couple of other wonderful uh questions it would be nice to know which schools played football first under what rule there seems to be considerable disagreement between rugby rules modern rules etc 
seems to be an issue between Stevens, Columbia, Rutgers, Lafayette, et cetera. Can you share anything that you know about that? Uh, Steve, Stevens played in like the, I, I forget the exact name of it, but it was called like the intercollegiate mm -hmm. football league or something like that. And that was played according to rules that were developed, I think in like the 1860s and 1870s. So it is true that like Stevens was like right there playing with uh, Rutgers, Columbia, Yale, Princeton, all these different schools. And I think the first record of a game being played with one of those schools was in 1872, but that's not official. But we do know that at, at least by 1873, we, we, we were playing in that league. I don't think Stevens played in the first game. I think that's, what was that? Yale and Rutgers or Princeton and Rutgers, something like that? Yeah, I believe so. Uh, yeah. But we, like football was huge at, at, at Stevens for a while. Um, eventually it was banned in 1925 uh, because it just got too violent. Like there were near, fat like near fatal situations on campus. And like Stevens couldn't support a good athletic program. I mean, the, all these other schools like had robust funding uh, for their teams, but Stevens was, it was just kind of like an extracurricular activity. So they were kind of being dominated like by the 1920s, like by these other like more uh, well-practiced teams. Uh, but we, we, we do have a lot of documentation in, in the archives, like some really great photos of uh, the football yeah. teams and matches being played against, you know, Yale, Princeton or, or wherever, but uh, reach out to us. We, we have tons of that stuff. And maybe that's another topic for a new lecture because yeah. the, the history of athletics at Stevens is like super fascinating. Uh, supposedly we have the longest continuously running lacrosse program in the country. Uh, Lee, I, I don't, I don't remember like the exact date, but it's, it goes back to sometime in the late 1800s. I, I thought it was like 1880s or something like that. Like, yeah, it's yeah. like really, really early, but uh, lacrosse, yeah. football, baseball, tennis, I mean, they were all huge. We'll have to do another lecture on the history of athletics. That has been brought up before, and we should um, we should definitely do that in the future. We also we have a great photo of Alexander Calder who played football at Stevens. You know, <laughs> even though to his own admission he was very terrible at it. So, but <laughs> that's all right. He made up for it in his amazing artistic skills. So yeah. <laughs> Um, so we have another question related. Um, we were told that the duck mascot was in honor of the librarian Francis Duck. Is that true or false? I haven't heard that one. I haven't heard that either. Um, I want that to be true. <laughs> the duck actually comes from the Stoop newspaper. Um, they created a mascot called Roto the Duck, like soon after the Stoop um, started in 1904. And they felt like they needed something to like increase school spirit. And so they, we have these great illustrations of Roto the Duck in the archives from early student staff members. Um, but the duck kind of went away, Roto the Duck anyways, went away in about 1907 when um, the student started increasing publication and became um, a weekly pu publication at that time. And they couldn't really keep up with, you know, the illustrations and things like that. Even though um, from, you know, what I've learned is the, the duck mascot has always been on campus, even though it wasn't formalized as Attila the Duck until, until 1972, where they actually had, um, you know, the student actually had hosted a election basically to vote on the mascot that you wanted and the name that you wanted. And then it was formalized in 1972. But if you ask alumni and if you look through the student, they, you know, those questions in the freshman hazing from 1960 before the mascot was formalized, people always said the duck. It was just always known that it was, you know, a duck mascot, even though the name Attila didn't come till 1972. Yeah, and, and some of the early uh, sports teams, like they, they didn't have any name, like uh, the original baseball team was just called the Stevens Nine, or the, I think the football team was like the Stevens 20 or something, you know, not that original, but you know, it got, got the job done. But uh, Attila as the name of the, or, uh, like the Stevens Ducks. Like I, I actually don't know like when the athletics teams started calling themselves the Ducks, but that, that'd be kind of interesting topic to research. Definitely. We have a few more questions. Um, I know we've, we're a little bit past five, but if you'd like to stay with us, we have a few more great questions and I think it would be a great opportunity to hear Leah and Ted um, answer them. Let's see. 
We have a question about, has anyone heard about the tradition of locking the Dean of Students in the ship's jail? Yes. <laughs> I know that question is from Bruce Blondina, right? Actually, oh. it's not, but that's, okay. that's, that's interesting. <laughs> oh, because I, I, I learned about that from Bruce Blondina, class of 1973, because he let me um, borrow photos of that incident. And I didn't know about that until I did an oral history with him, which is why we need to do oral histories, because that's not something that's documented in the student at all. But um, it was, wait, which dean was it? It wasn't Dean Everson, it was another dean. But um, I, I actually, we have digital copies of um, the dean getting locked up in the S.S. Stevens jail. Yeah. Yeah, Leah did a post about that on our Instagram. So check, check yeah. out our Instagram at uh, Stevens Archives. Great. Excellent. But you had a really good sense of humor about it. <laughs> it seemed like. <laughs> Um, we have one comment um, that was, it's interesting, uh, in 1970, uh, had the legendary Charles Schnabel Anchorman Award, who graduated with the lowest cumulative average. So that seemed to be similar. That's great. Okay. That's, that's very interesting. We'll have to look that up. Um, we have a comment, uh, lacrosse started in 1884, uh, and this person still has a booklet celebrating 100 years of lacrosse at Stevens. Oh, amazing. Yeah, yeah we, we, we have that, that book yeah. in the, the archives. We, we should digitize that, actually, put, put that online. We should, yeah. That would be great. And I'm sure our lacrosse team would love to see that as well, mm -hmm. if they haven't already. Um, and let's see. OK. Um, right, so we have a question. Um, can you provide a compendium of old students to alumni in the future and a follow-up, at least front page articles. Brings us to our next slide. Yeah, <laughs> great question. Uh, we, we actually uh, recently created a, like a digital collections portal. So it's, it's kind of like a one-stop shop for our digital collections, digital exhibits, uh, Leah's oral history project, and uh, old uh, master's theses and dissertations to some of them going back to the, to the 1950s. So one of the collections uh, is the Stute collection and we have everything from about 1904 uh, to 1950. Uh, and that's all, that's all been digitized and made available to you online. So just follow the, the link mm -hmm. uh, here in the slide and have at it. <laughs> yeah, and we, 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 and we want feedback about it too, um, if, if you have any suggestions yeah. for how it can be improved. We're also, we, we keep on uploading more and more, so keep checking back. We're trying to uh, make more available online, so. Yeah, Leah just up, like she, she mentioned uh, the senior trip to uh, Akron, Ohio, and uh, we just put up like a really cool exhibit about uh, airships, uh, floats and balloons and things that were manufactured at, at the Goodyear plant in Ohio. So yeah. a lot of really weird imagery there, especially of like the unpainted bases, day parade floats, uh, you know, before they got like the, the faces and the coloring and everything, they're just these bare kind of weirdly shaped balloons just floating in the sky. There's some really cool imagery in there. Yeah, it's one of my favorite collections actually. <laughs> Photograph, yeah. Um, we have a comment from Marcel Simon, 1978, class of 1978. Mm -hmm. The seniors kidnapping the pledge class president and leaving him somewhere without money was a living tradition at Sigma Nu while I was an undergraduate and continued for at least five years after I graduated. Oh, wow. Okay. That's great. Um, we want to hear that story. Reach yeah, out to Yeah, I know. Us. It's yeah. not as well documented in the archives, actually. Like, I mean, kidnappings are mentioned, but not with that detail, you know? So <laughs> those would make for great oral histories for sure. Yeah. Um, there is a comment, the Stevens Dramatic so Society has a tradition, had a tradition during freshman week, at least into the late 1960s, where we staged a production of the good ship Communipaw Flats. It was a melodrama in which a Stevens engineer saved the ship from exploding by releasing the pressure. We did it every year while um, they were there, I was in the infamous class of 1969. <laughs> I have heard of that tradition, actually. We don't have a lot of documentation on it, but I, I am aware of that tradition. So I think we have to do a part two <laughs> to this lecture, because there's so much, I mean, there's so much we can cover, but um, yeah, I would love to learn more about that as well, because we don't have, I don't believe we have a lot of documentation on that, but I am, I am aware of that, yeah. Yeah, we, I, I can't think of 
a lot of stuff on that specifically, but we, we do have a lot of Germanic society materials like going mm -hmm. way, way back. I mean, even going back into like early glee club, there used to be like a banjo and mandolin club. So a lot of like the dramatic arts or the musical groups of early Stevens history are, are pretty well represented too. And we have like playbills uh, from, or, or sheet music from some of the productions, because I know that like there was, a, a, it was called like a Stevens varsity show. And it was basically students writing the music, writing the script and then producing it for like a senior banquet or uh, alumni dinners and, you know, other sort of uh, get togethers and things like that throughout the year. Great. Um, we have one question. Uh, would you like some slide rules for the library collections? Uh, this person has over 100 slide rules. Oh, wow. You know, I have to say we, we love getting objects um, into the archives, but we have a lot of slide rules already. <laughs> so I'd have to um, see what exactly they are and, you know, the uniqueness because we do have, we, you know, we have to be mindful of the space in the collection area. Um, and that's something that we actually do have a lot of from over the years. Yeah, but thank you. Okay, great. Um, we have, let's see, no additional questions, but we do have some additional comments, which uh, if, if, in the interest of time, we can, you know, maybe uh, save them in the chat and uh, they will be, um, I guess, archived in this recording. Or if you want, I can read them now. It's up to you. Um, oh, the comments or? More? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, we have a few. yeah we have a few um some uh, there is a comment about the award for the lowest grade point average the story told by upperclassmen when i was a freshman is that a the award was given at graduation and b the last winner waved at the audience and to all the professors who made this possible end quote and c flashed a vulgar middle finger gesture the award was canceled after that so the story goes <laughs> Um, and um, you, you engineers are uh, an interesting bunch. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right, right. And um, absolutely, they're our favorites. Um, let's see, I believe that at the commencement for class of 1968, there were two VIPs that predicted that we should do the best we can through 2000 since world would end due to overpopulation or nuclear war and we survived. So <laughs> there you go. And then we also have a couple of people who um, shared that they were um, actors and participants in the Pride of uh, the Good Ship Pride production. So, yeah. yeah so, um, and they were going to do it for the 150th anniversary, and hopefully, we'll be able to do that in the future so. when we can all get back together or perhaps even virtually. So, yeah. um, we have a couple of other comments, and it sounds like some people will be reaching out to you, Leah and Ted. So, that's really <laughs> wonderful. That's, that's fantastic. That. Yes. <laughs> Please reach out. But yeah, I mean, there, there's no shortage of topics to talk about. I mean, we didn't even get into like student publications. Like there's a really, really rich history of like humor magazines, literary magazines, art, visual art. Uh, so plenty, plenty of things to talk about. I do think we have to do a part two for this one for traditions because there's just so much. And yeah, student publications would be great because we have, yeah. you know, a lot of amazing things on that. Yeah. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Leah and Ted. This has been a wonderful event, and we're so thankful that all of you could join us today. Um, of course, look forward to the archived presentation that you can watch um, at your leisure in the future, and please join us for the next event, and that is August 19th, correct? Yeah, August 19th. Yeah, August 19th at 4 p.m. Um, alumni. Yeah, history of some alumni. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. It's, it's been a pleasure to be here today with everyone and we hope that you've enjoyed this day today. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> yeah, thanks everybody. Thank you, take care.